so uh, today uh, we have reached the uh, eighth aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is concentration. And um, a really, uh, you know, a topic that uh, we'll see if I can cover it in one session. Certainly, certainly could take many sessions, but um, I don't want to linger too long. In any case, um, I was thinking about how to guide the meditation today, if I should do something particularly concentration oriented. But I think one of the mistakes we make is thinking of concentration as something really separate from mindfulness. They're, they're really partners. And, and when, we, when we, every time we come back to the breath, that is an act we do in order to cultivate concentration. And of course, when we come back to the breath, we are engaging with mindfulness of the breath. So it, it's, it's not so easy to separate them or to even see them as differently. Joseph Goldstein, I recall him once, I, I, this may have been a standard thing that he said, I, I heard him say it more than once actually, that a moment of mindfulness is a moment of concentration, um, which kind of sums it up in a way. The, I think the main distinguishing difference and the reason concentration is so important is that you can have a moment of mindfulness that disappears very quickly and you can then kind of return to you know, some other state of non-mindfulness. And so to, to sustain mindfulness, we need, <clears throat> we need a degree of concentration. And with that sustained mindfulness and sustained concentration really comes the fruits of meditation practice. So it really, to kind of try to just practice mindfulness and not think about concentration is to really limit the potential of your practice. So I actually had the thought that <clears throat> my guided meditation today just should be silent <laughs> because in a way that's, you know, more supportive of concentration uh, than anything. But you have hopefully lots of opportunities for silent meditation. And here I am <laughs> with a job to do. So I will, uh, I'll give some guidance. Uh, and now I will sit back a little bit. Uh, And so, as always, oh, wow. has my microphone been on? <laughs> it shouldn't have been on. <laughs> uh, wow, okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to take a moment of technical. Uh, interesting, okay. Sorry for that interruption. All right. So just settling into your meditation posture. And the importance of posture first is with helping us to stay alert. So we want to be upright if that's feasible for our bodies. And you can close your eyes or just lower your gaze so that your attention is less distracted by visual impressions. 
and just feeling your body at rest in stillness. And stillness itself is also a strong supporting factor for the development of concentration. And feeling the body breathing. So just starting with just that general sense of feeling how the chest is rising and falling. You might take a deeper breath or two, just release that slowly to let the body relax. There's this quality of arriving. And often when we sit down to meditate and establish our posture and close our eyes, we become aware of how much motion there has been in our mind, in our body. So just arriving is a good beginning for our meditation. You can begin to bring the attention more closely to the sensations of breath. Yeah, the concentration object becomes the touch of breath at the nostrils or the movement of breath in the belly. And if it's difficult to connect with the specific sensations of breath, then go back to the just more general feeling of the body breathing. You don't want to get into a struggle with trying to feel something you think you're supposed to feel. The breath is just a convenient thing to pay attention to because it's always there. And it's a relatively neutral experience most of the time. other obstructions to paying attention to the breath include a very busy mind. Perhaps the thought stream is just very persistent right now. Again, not to come into conflict with this, to see it. And perhaps to feel the energy behind that. That energy might be a kind of anxiety or 
a sense of, kind of a, the need to think, I need to worry about this. I need to figure this out. So we feel that sense of need or anxiety. And you can feel that in your body and breathe into that. It's not pleasant, but when we breathe with it, we can start to quiet those feelings a bit, just giving them space. If you're able to connect with the sensations of breath, bring a really careful curiosity to those sensations. The whole experience of a breath. One breath is not just one experience, it's many different sensations rapidly revealing themselves. paying close attention naturally increases the concentration. We don't have to try to concentrate. Just pay close attention.
as any period of meditation deepens or extends, the mind changes, the attention changes. Sometimes things get quieter. Sometimes things get busier. The mind rebels at the stillness or the quiet. The body gets restless. It's helpful not to have expectations or judgments about how your experience unfolds. But just stay with it. Try to keep mindfulness and an openness and acceptance and an interest in what's arising.
All right. Well, greetings again. And for those who arrived during the meditation, welcome. So again, the topic for today is uh, the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path, concentration. And as usual, we have a kind of a language problem <laughs> because we're translating a word, samadhi, that doesn't have the same meaning in English. So I like the term calm abiding to describe what we're working with. Calm describes the internal experience and ab abiding kind of creates this sense of just resting and, and kind of a sustained resting um, with the, the uh, ING makes it, gives it action, gives it movement. So calm abiding, that it's something that's sustained, that calmness that's sustained. So I wanted to talk first about the uh, relationship of, of calm abiding or samadhi or concentration with, in recovery. And, and to start by saying that the kind of, um, Synonym in, in Dharma language is serenity. And that really starts to point to the first aspect. I would say there's two key aspects, but the first aspect that's really important about concentration as a, you know, as a meditative tool and, and as a, um, a tool for recovery. And that is that you know, when we develop this capacity to calm the mind, to quiet the internal noise, to sustain, to, to develop calm abiding, to feel peaceful, this, first of all, makes us much less likely to relapse because this is a pleasant state to be in. And there we're not um, emotionally we are much more balanced. So there's a close relationship between concentration and equanimity, which is, you know, the, this idea of kind of emotional balance that's not easily disturbed. And so this is, uh, you know, when we think about, um, you know, interactions with people, and we've all had those moments when we're, uh, easily set off somebody says something and we just kind of like get angry or get reactive but i think we've also all had those moments when we when we're kind of not e not easily triggered and because when we have an internal calm someone else gets angry and we can see it and it's not setting something off in us so the, our meditation practice can help us to more often be in that kind of balanced state that's not reactive. So it's really helpful in our worldly existence, in our social interactions, in our business interactions, in our intimate interactions, to have this quality of calm. You know, when, when I think about equanimity, I... I see a Buddhist monk, you know, I mean, sort of the image of the monk is somebody who's not easily disturbed. Uh, and, uh, you know, a monk or nun, I mean, a monastic. Uh, and, and I think it's a really good um, model for us and sort of image for us to keep in mind uh, to try to cultivate this quality of inner calm, of calm abiding. So the other side, uh, the, uh, I was saying there are two elements of uh, concentration that are important, and they're important 
generally, but I think particularly we can point to their importance in recovery. The other side is the, the quality of mental clarity that comes. You know, when, when the mind is not so agitated, when we're not caught up in the hindrances, which we could sort of talk about the hindrances, but just generally, you know, when we, uh, the, when the mind is, is clear in that way, we're able to have insight into ourselves and into others. We are able to make more wise decisions. Um, we're able to understand the world around us. Again, because we're not seeing everything through our own lens of fear or projection, you know, uh, resentment, judgment. It, we're just seeing things as they are. And this is tremendously freeing. And this is, this is the development of wisdom. This is how wisdom arises. So whenever we, in the suttas, the, the ancient discourses and teachings of the Buddha, when the Buddha talks about this process of enlightenment, it always involves, not always, usually involves a process of the development of concentration that then breaks through into this powerful insight. Of, you know, uh, that's, you know, certain language that characterizes it as like light, seeing like this term enlightenment. Actually, Bhikkhu Bodhi has been talking about how the term enlightenment is actually a pretty good uh, English term for what the Buddha was saying. We, you know, we have the insight meditation is like insight, vipassana, to see clearly. So there's this whole sort of visual uh, imagery or that goes with the awakening process. And of course, when you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes. And so, so seeing is, a, is very much a uh, kind of uh, a great metaphor for uh, enlightenment. So we can see that these two sides, the, the calm and the clarity, are so important in our lives, so important in our recovery. You know, in addiction, these are two things that we do not have. We do not have inner calm, and we do not have mental clarity. And the lack of those things turns into an, an inner churning that keeps triggering us over and over to grasping after our addiction because we don't we we are the the turmoil the inner turmoil the lack of calm creates a feeling of such discomfort and then without any clarity about a wise way to respond to that we just impulsively and kind of instinctively reach out for the first thing, which is the easiest thing, which is that drug or behavior of choice that's, that will give us something immediate to deal with this inner turmoil and, and agitation and pain. So obviously it's a lot of work to get from that place of turmoil and um, delusion, you know, the, the, the lack of clarity. It's a lot of work to get from there to a place of calm and clarity. And a lot of that work has nothing to do with meditation, which is why I don't suggest that meditation alone is a uh, recovery program. You know, I, th I, th I think before you can even get to a place where you can meditate at all, you have to do other work, you know, step one, step two, step three, you know, the steps, <laughs> kind of. That's why meditation is in step 11. And that's not to say that you have to wait until you've, you know, written your inventory and done your amends before you dare sit down and meditate. But it's just to say that, you know, if you, particularly if you have been in a, a real struggle with addiction, I mean, I know some people come into recovery 
where things are less tumultuous in their life and they're, and it's and they're kind of ready to to change fairly quickly but for someone who's really been struggling it's gonna t take a while you know just to get to a place where you can sit still you know i've gone into uh treatment centers um to teach meditation uh, i used to do that regularly and i found that you know there'd be maybe 10 or 12 people in the room and four of them would fall asleep while I was meditating. You know, two of them would leave. Um, two or three of them would just sort of sit there with their eyes open or just looking around. And then there'd be like two or three that would be like into it, you know, uh, which seemed about right, you know. Like, and then after, after the meditation, those two or three who were into it would would get in dialogue with me and and some of the others would be interested but um you know you just you just would see that people who are you know in rehab who are obviously brand new to recovery or at least to this time in recovery because they're often returning folks were not ready most of them were not ready for to step right into meditation but when we are ready it can really be a huge support, as we know. So I don't want to, I don't have to proselytize to this group about the value of meditation. But let me talk some more about, about samadhi and concentration. It's, it's one of the most um, debated, actually, issues in in Buddhism is the the question the question being how how much concentration do you need in order to become enlightened <laughs> a big question historically in Buddhism and there's this one system called jhanas that's where I you know if I'm going to give another talk on this it might have to be on that but I'll, I'll briefly say jhanas are meditative absorptions and they are really altered states in which when one is completely absorbed in jhanas and i haven't had this experience i've had some experience of jhanic sort of jhanic experiences but not to this level but that when you're completely absorbed in them you know there's you don't hear anything and you're com you're completely separated kind of from the external world so absorbed right and so that's a really powerful one-pointedness. But there's also a very strong and much more, I think, in, the, in contemporary Western Buddhism, much stronger stream of a focus, not on one-pointedness, but on open awareness. And, and a, a concentration, again, the wrong word, kind of a, 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 a calm clarity that is taking in a broad range of experience simultaneously. Awareness of the body, noticing thoughts, hearing sounds, feeling emotions or feelings, and being present for this all as a kind of flow of experience. Very different from one-pointedness, from just holding your mind on the breath or holding your mind on a, on a particular feeling or uh, uh, you know, image. So, Again, there's this is like a sort of area of debate. And first, first of all, some people are more capable of one-pointed concentration than others, <laughs> and, and I would say generally, addicts and alcoholics <laughs> tend to not be so great at one point in concentration but that's a really broad generalization so I, some of you may be great at it um, and so where it gets messy <laughs> is our own projections this is the thing that we I think it it's so important because I, I see it causing so much struggle in people around their meditation. The, the, the self-judgment about your own capacity to stay with the breath 
or to stay with a single object. And the self-judgment just creates another layer of agitation. So the sooner you can let go of that, the sooner you're actually going to get to a place of calm abiding. What it seems to take, and this is my formulation that's never been validated by any other teacher, so you should ask other teachers what they think. My formulation is that the keys to calm abiding into concentration are stillness, silence, and time. If we are still and silent for an extended period of time, we will tend to develop calm abiding. Now, that's of, of course leaves out one key thing, which is the thing that you're concentrating on. But my experience is that that's not so important. It can be the breath, it can be sounds, it can be loving kindness, it can be a mantra, it, you know, the object of concentration. Yes, you need a con an object of concentration, but what that is, isn't nearly as important as these three things, stillness, silence, and time. And where do we develop concentration? The people develop the most concentration typically on silent meditation retreats. And what are they doing on silent meditation retreats? They are sitting still in silence for long periods of time. And if many of you have been on retreats and some of you have been on longer, pretty long retreats, you know that there are these developmental phases of concentration that just happen. I, 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 again, I... I and, I, and that's not magic, it's, it's ca causes and conditions that allow that to unfold. But, but what it does not require is for you to be this uniquely special spiritual person who has the capacity to concentrate, you know. If you show up and do that work, I, I, I got to say, I, I don't know if anybody can't attain calm abiding, you know. Maybe, you know. But, uh, but people will come to me, well, I've got ADHD or whatever. I'm like, just go sit. You know, that's I, just go sit, sit long enough, and you're going to break through. It took me a while. Uh, you know, it took me uh, 10 days. To, uh, I, I went on a five day retreat, a three day retreat, and then a 22 day retreat. And it wasn't until the 22 day retreat, halfway through, that I got to this place. And the thing is, it's, it's kind of like breaking through a membrane. Once your mind finds that place, it becomes more capable of finding it again, which is, you know, makes sense. It's partly, you know, the brain science of it, right? The, the uh, neural pathways being established, but it's also just kind of being familiar with it, you know? It's like a muscle, you know, learning a, a particular, um, you know, athletic movement. I'll try to avoid mentioning any particular sports that involve movement, but, you know, the, the, you, know you, move, you develop, a, you do a certain movement over, over and over, and there's this, what we call muscle memory. I don't know if that's an actual scientific term, but that's what we call it, right? Your body gets used to it. You get familiar with it. At first, it can feel completely awkward, but once you have it, you know, it's like riding a bike, right? You come back to it, you get on, great. The same is true of meditation. Once you find that place of calm abiding, you're much more able to find it again. And um, and all that kind of self-judgment kind of disappears. Um, I don't know, there's, uh, there were, there's other things I can talk about, but, um, oh, I, I get, well, I, I will say, I, I, I want to, again, kind of emphasize this idea of, of a kind of open awareness. So, in your daily practice, 
you want to start to um, kind of establish your own meditative routine. And, you know, there are, there are suggestions about how to do this, and I, I'll talk about some of them. But I think what's most important is for you to find the things that kind of help you to settle. So that might be starting by repeating some words or, you know, repeating a mantra or repeating loving kindness phrases, or it might be, you know, feeling your breath very, like taking some deep breaths and really feeling that, or it might be just kind of, you know, what I like to do is I just get into my posture and I, ah, and I kind of, I feel like I'm just letting everything go. But what I find, again, is most important for me is to just sit there. Because at first, I don't find that there's anything I can do that immediately can get me focused. It just, I sit down, you know, and I, and I meditate fairly soon after getting up in the morning. I haven't done anything particularly other than kind of shower and get dressed. So it's not like there's a lot going on, but I sit down and there's this energy of the mind. And of course we know when we're asleep, we're still doing stuff in our mind. So it, it feels like I just have to let it settle. And it's a little like, you know, stirring up the, the water that's got dirt in the bottom, you know, and you stir it up. And then if you just leave it alone, the dirt settles. So I guess in this analogy, my thoughts are dirt, you know, it's just kind of it. And, and the Buddha actually has a very similar analogy to this with the hindrances. But it's, it's not so much that, I, and it's not that I don't do anything. I do try to feel the breath and I do try to relax and I do try to keep coming back the breath. And, you know, I might smile but it's mostly just that I sit there and kind of let the dirt settle, let the mud settle. And, and that clarity is there. That's the mysterious thing, too. And, you know, I, I will say, let me talk about the hindrances a little bit, and then I'll wrap up and open it up. That the hindrances, desire and aversion, sleepiness, restlessness, doubt, they are what block the development of calm abiding concentration. And when they are removed, what's there is this calm and clarity, which means, which implies, and this is sort of the, the idea behind Buddha, that everyone has Buddha nature, that when we just remove the hindrances, the blockages, the calm and the clarity are already there. We're not like trying to find them and dig them up and, and where is it and how do I make it come? It's actually there. So it's very much in kind of harmony with the principle like Buddhist like the main concept of Buddhism, which is let go. If I were going to sum up Buddhism in two words, it would be let go. And so what we're saying is let go or allow to pass, to quiet, the things that get in the way. Let go of craving, let go of dullness, let go of restlessness. And it's all there. You don't have to cultivate it. You don't have to do anything special to bring it about. So that's enough uh, for now, and I will open it up to see if there are any questions or comments. Hello, Deborah.
Uh, you need to unmute. I, I did it for you. Thank you. You're so kind. With my pa uh, Zoom powers. <laughs> uh, two comments. One is practice, both in mindfulness and in meditation, is cumulative. So that's been such a resource. I didn't kind of get that at first. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, once when I was in rehab, we had meditation and it was silent. And one of my roommates had a really hard time with it. Mm -hmm. And she said, confidentially to me, sometimes I just say my rosary. <laughs> and I, okay, you're meditating. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and she felt so relieved afterwards that she didn't feel guilty about saying her rosary. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's so interesting when you look at a rosary and then you look at mala beads, you go, okay, well, it's the same thing, right? And and with the rosary, you just keep saying the same things over and over, you know, and you're just repeating. And the Hail Mary, uh, you know, a decade ago, or so ago, I was on a a month long retreat, and the Hail Mary came to mind, and I was like, "Oh, wow, this is really a powerful prayer." Um, I mean, the beautiful thing of calling out to Mary, who is like you know the symbol of compassion, who's really the Kuan Yin of Christianity, but then it talks about you know death, <laughs> and now and in the hour of my death. Oh, so it's like really. Uh, a, a very powerful, beautiful prayer. Great contemplation. That's nice. Thanks. Richie. Yes, hello, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, there, were, there were a couple things that were so helpful to me today because I, I was having trouble with the, with the word concentration. Yeah because it implied like efforting to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. And so I, I came up with calm, stable awareness, mm -hmm. you know, from my, my background, you know, cause we talk about that. And, you know, I have the same thing with intention, you know, where um, I realized that most people, when they talk about it, they mean like, and I, I may be all wrong with this, but my understand, my limited understanding, the motivation. Uh-huh. Or then, you know, I intend for my breath to stay here or I intend for my, you know, no, it's, it's not that it's so anyway, finding out what, what my teacher means by a certain word to me is, is really critical. And I got a lot of that today. I was so glad to hear you talk about um, early sobriety and things because I, I've been to Buddhist recovery meetings of late quite a few and and you know there are times when um you know like a guy still got the shakes yeah. you know and i'm like man you know you got to get in somebody's pocket and you know this and, and you know and, and you know it, you can't duck the first step by <laughs> um, you know what i mean by deciding oh i'm going to do this I, you know I, i'm going to meditate and i'm going to fix myself yeah so, so it's, yeah, it, it's, it's really good um, to hear that, to hear that stuff. Yeah. And, and um, you, you know, I, I, I think it's mostly, um, I guess that's, that's mostly what I have to say, just to appreciate, uh, you know, what, what you gave to us today and, uh, yeah. you know, just, an hour ago, I was driving through Bethlehem. So, oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, medical appointments down there, of course. Yeah. But anyway, uh, but, thanks. But for those who don't know, he's talking about Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, is my hometown. So, <laughs> yeah, I still I'm have. In I'm in Shawnee, so I'm right. Oh, there. you are. Yeah. yeah, it's. I still have family there. We. I was just back there last spring with my daughter. Nice. Um, thanks, thanks, Richie. Um, and, you know, I don't talk very much about early recovery, and partly it is because of uh, the, that fact that what I'm offering I don't feel is a rehab, you know. I, I'm 
you know, offering something for someone who's already got some grounding in recovery, uh, you know, uh, on our retreats. Uh, speaking of which, um, we are uh, planning a retreat uh, in May, May 15th to the 20th. So uh, save the date. We haven't, we'll be putting out the specifics uh, in the next couple weeks, but uh, if you're interested, and it'll be in Northern California as usual, our safe space, um, but uh, also our you know convenient place. Um, but uh, you know, you're not going to go on a retreat like that if you're one week, you know, sober. You know, it's not it's not recommended. We we actually sort of ask people to be have a certain amount of uh, recovery we, we it sort of varies certainly at least 30 days but it's much better if it's like six months to a year anyway ah angela hello hello your, your volume's a little low oh uh that's better. Can you hear me better now? Okay. I have these headphones on. So, um, it's hard to know how loud I'm talking. Uh, thank you for class today. It was really helpful. Um, I, yeah, a lot of emotion was coming up um, in meditation and I just, it was interesting just how you were saying things can come up and the mind changes and um, but yeah being able to sit with that um, is really helpful you know the the sadness or the worry or whatever it is like, is, is very helpful um and yeah i've been starting to read um Saida Utejaniya's book, When Awareness Becomes Natural. And um, he is talking about the same thing that you were just talking about, how it's already there, um, the concentration. And um, so I just thought I'd offer a few things too, because I was thinking about how um, my sponsor, she often says, just notice. Um, like, just notice whenever we're talking about anything <laughs> and i just mm -hmm. i come back a lot how how powerful just to notice side um when i talk about this, i like to recognize and notice and um because concentration and focus can seem like efforting like what what riching um so yeah, I just, I told my sponsor that when we met on Sunday that like I'm reading the book and saying notes is, is just a nicer, because yeah, I tend malady, I tend to, um, yeah, be hard on myself. And so yeah, everything that you said, I related to today and um, to just try to be easier on myself. I mean, even reading this book, I'm like, the story of how you know oh i'm not understanding it i need to go back and read this like it's like it's it's so interesting to watch mm. my mind and to just notice so anyway yeah. i just wanted to offer that little saying you know but also yeah equanimity and the and the um the serenity prayer you know i attended a day long with james barraz on equanimity and he brought up the serenity prayer um and mm. Yeah, so just that and stealing and my material. <laughs> <laughs> so I've stolen uh, a lot of his material. So <laughs> turn about as well. It's play. all Dharma. It's all Dharma, Kevin. Oh, oh, darn! <laughs> I thought I had a copyright on it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Nice to be with everyone yeah. today. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I actually. <sighs> just notice i don't i it's a great it's a critical starting point but I, i'm not sure it's for me it's i don't think it's enough you know and i i, I don't want to undermine what you're saying or what the other people are telling you but 
When things are difficult and painful, I need to also bring that self-compassion, you know, there, I need to bring something to engage, you know, and, and I know just notice isn't really meant to say that you're not engaged. I, I'm just saying like it could be taken as sort of a limiting thing. And, you know, as I'm, as you know, I've been working a lot with the Anapanasati Sutta and there are noticing aspects of it. And then there are very intentional cultivating aspects of it, you know, um, tranquilizing the body or calming the body, calming the mind, you know, and, and looking for, you know, trying to develop concentration. So it's, I, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, just as a, as a like single statement, I would want to see more of what's being, what someone is saying. Oh. Very odd, my volume just like dropped to zero. Why did that happen? <laughs> wow, uh, okay. I can hear um, okay. Anyway, you can hear me still? Mm -hmm. You're good. My, um, in any case, uh, it's probably something I'm sitting on. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna buy that as the, the enough. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's enough either. I mean, I No, I can't hear yeah. you. Oh, I can't hear you because my volume is like down. Okay. And it's like turning itself down. Oh, so interesting. <laughs> okay, well then. <laughs> if you want to say something to me, you're going to have to write in the chat. What? I don't know. Computers can't live with them, can't live without them. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, uh, so that means I can't, I'm, uh, I'm turning the volume up and then it's just turning itself down. Wow. That's impressive. Um, Billy, can you write, write something in the chat? And then I'm just going to have to give up because it's after 11 anyway, so. I apologize for this. Um, my uh, IT department has been falling down on the job lately. Very strange things have been happening. There we go. Uh, page 256 of my workbook or of... Oh, of One Breath at a Time. Oh, I oh. wonder what it says. It's it's not them. It's my computer. It's 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 Can telling me? me that my volume is off, and then when I turn it back on, it up. It just turns itself back down. So darn yeah. it! <laughs> I can hear um, you. Two fifty six. Oh, yeah. oh, right. I was talking about that a while ago about enlightenment. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna um, not address that right now uh, because it's sort of another story. Uh, um, Jim says, "I think that's uh, the, I think the thing that's missing from your concentration for me ethical behavior. Maybe that's just assumed. That's a no. That's a really good point." Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't think we should ever assume ethical behavior. <laughs> uh, absolutely, Jim. Thank you for that reminder. Um, interesting. 
Uh, generally, yeah. I mean, that's that's part of the formula for sure, and it's and it's always part of the formula in terms of how the Buddha teaches it. So thank you for that reminder. So I am going to uh, say adieu uh, and say thank you all for coming, and I will be around on Friday evening, and. Um, just to let you know that my uh, my website is got updated with uh, all of the classes that have been recorded uh, up to uh, just a couple days ago. So if you're if you miss something, you want to listen to something again, they're on audio and on video. So enjoy those, uh, and certainly if you want to offer some dana, that's always appreciated. Um, I'm going to be doubling the price of the class, by the way. So it's, uh, since it's nothing, the class doesn't cost anything. That'll be two times nothing. Inflation. All right, you guys. <laughs> be well. That's the best humor I could come up with for a Tuesday morning. <laughs>